Hello, everyone. My name is Herman Ross. I'm a senior research scientist at In the Labs, and I'm here to present the results of the Carla Autonomous Driving Challenge 2020. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our partner at Alpha Drive for helping us put together this amazing uh, leaderboard platform that enables people to automatically test and verify their agents. Uh, and of course, thank you very much for helping us with the Carla Autonomous Driving Challenge 2020. Also, this activity will have never been possible without the generous contribution of our sponsors, AWS and Intel. Thank you very much for making this happen. Now, uh, let's just start explaining what is the Carla Autonomous Driving Challenge 2020. Uh, in a nutshell, the Carla Challenge is a platform where agents are validated in terms of safety driving. So you can you can see this as agents having to drive from a starting point to a destination following a given route. That route will be given as a set of GPS coordinates. Uh, through each of these routes, uh, your agent will encounter different situations, very challenging situations that we would call traffic scenarios. Uh, these traffic scenarios are basically a collection of situations that typically happen in real life uh, that cause accidents, that call, cause fatalities. Uh, we would like to, to be able to, to address in a, in a safe fashion. So we have events such as uh, going around a vehicle that is blocking our path, uh, having to stop the presence of pedestrians, having to yield to oncoming traffic, etc. So our agents need to be able to address these situations. Uh, in the Carla Challenge, we have. 10 routes, 10 canonical routes in a secret map. And these 10 routes are repeated for two different set of weathers. Uh, the first weather is basically your typical sunny day. So it's sunny, weather's nice, basically it's good. And the second weather is way more challenging. So it's, uh, it's during night, it's foggy, it's raining, it's pretty challenging. So yeah. For these two weathers, uh, we have five repetitions for statistical significance. So in the end, we end up having a uh, hundred routes, which in total feature 173 kilometers of driving experiences. So for, for the successful driving stack to, to be on the top of the leaderboard, it will have to drive around 100 73 kilometers without any traffic infractions. Now, let's talk a little bit about the metrics. Uh, the main metric of the Carla Tom Schramming Challenge and the leaderboard is called the driving score. The driving score is just a combination of two factors. Uh, the percentage of route completed, uh, an infraction penalty. And this is average with respect to the total number of routes that is represented with N. Uh, the completion of the route is basically just uh, a percentage of the amount of the route that has been completed by an, ag an agent before running out of time or getting a stack or suffering any other problem. Then that is combined with this factor that represents the number of infraction calls as part of that route. So every time you collide with another vehicle or with a pedestrian or run a red light, that is accounted for in this term. Uh, in this case, it has been represented as a multiplicative term. Uh, so for each of these infractions, uh, we have a coefficient pj that gets applied as many times as infractions are in that route. So let's have a look 
at the infractions. For the infractions, we have represented a collision with pedestrian with a score of 0 0.5, meaning that every time you collide with a pedestrian, your score gets split in half. Then we have collision with other vehicle. So every time you collide with another vehicle, you just keep 60% of your total score. And then we have others, collisions with layout. So every time you collide with sidewalks or a pole or anything else, running a red light and running a stop sign. These are the main penalties of the, of the challenge. So in the end, the better you drive, the safer you are, less infractions you make, the higher is your score. Now, in this Carla Automotive Showing Challenge, uh, we enabled two different modalities. Uh, the first one was based purely on sensors. So you get access to setting up your own uh, sensor stack uh, based on uh, GNSS, IMUs, LIDARs, radars, RGB cameras, and speedometers. And the second modality is an extension of the sensor track where you can also get access to an HD map where you have all the topology or and the layout of the scene. You already have uh, the description of the different lanes, traffic signs, and so on. Now, let's talk a little bit about the submission process. Uh, in order to participate in the Carlo Tomo Showing Challenge, we have provided a CLI that users can call in order to take their code and submit it to our network. Once their code reaches our network as a Docker container, this is paired up with a Carla simulator. Uh, both Docker containers will call using the Carla API on top of uh, AWS. So in this case, the Carla container will be testing the code of the agent dynamically taking it through all the secret routes one by one through all the different weathers and repetitions producing results for the agent. Then those results will be sent out to, to a server where all the data is collected and presented through the leaderboard. So the Carl Autonomous Driving Challenge 2020 in numbers. Uh, in this challenge, we have received, we have approved more than 45 teams. Uh, among these 45 teams, uh, they run more than 6,000 hours of simulation and more than 6,900 kilometers were driven. I think these are pretty impressive numbers uh, for the 2020 challenge, definitely higher than the 2019 challenge. So we're pretty proud about this. Let's now take a look at the results. So here we see the results for the sensor track. On the left side, we see uh, the driving score of the public submissions. These are the submissions that were made public within the timeline uh, for the challenge, and therefore the ones that can participate in the 2020 challenge. We see that the winning team, Merlin, got a driving score of almost 25 points. This is a significant increase in respect of previous years for a score way, where around eight points. Now, if we analyze uh, these results in depth, we see that Merlin was able to complete on average 46% of the route, which means like typically it was able, the agent was able to get to half of the route. And here we can see an analysis of infractions. So we have summarized the number of infractions per kilometer to represent, to try to simplify the understanding of how often uh, these agents encounter different type of problems. Uh, 
So overall, the winning, the winning agent typically encounters a little bit more than one infraction per kilometer. So every kilometer this agent drives, it will encounter an infraction. So it will cross against another vehicle, or it will cross against the layout, or it will run a red light, and so on and so forth. So you can see the actual, the full analysis of infractions in the Liverpool website and on this table. We would like to congratulate the rest of the participants uh, for their great work in the challenge. So I would encourage you all to take a look at the number of infractions per kilometer and the final results to better understand uh, how these systems are able to perform today. It is very interesting to see the difference in infractions uh, of the different approaches, how some of them actually are more conservative in terms of infractions and commit less infractions, but are also able to navigate uh, a shorter distance before getting stuck. So it's definitely, definitely interesting to come to the Your World website and take a look at the results and read all the papers. Okay, for the map track, actually uh, nobody submitted, uh, so it was fully deserted. Uh, I think part of that, uh, in retrospective, we believe it's due to the fact that uh, there are no good APIs yet to handle uh, HD maps so that people can easily get access to the information they're contained. Uh, the Carla team is now working on providing a better interface for that. So we expect that in the future, many new participants will compete in this track. So congratulations to, to the winner. Uh, so Marine Turmanov, Emily Wirbel, and Fabian Mozart. So they won the Carla Challenge 2020 using their work end to end model free reinforcement learning for urban driving using implicit affordances, which was published uh, during last APR. Uh, well, congratulations. Uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing your talk. Thank you very much to all of you for participating in the challenge. Uh, thank you to our sponsors for their support. Hello everyone, I'm Maran Toromanov. I'm a PhD student at MinParitech and Valeo, the French automotive supplier. Today, I will present the work I made for the Kala Autonomous Driving Challenge 2020, entitled End-to-end -end model free reinforcement learning for urban driving using implicit avoidances. This work has been made with my two supervisors, Professor Fabien Moutarn from MinParitech and Dr. Emily Wirbel from Valeo. So first, this work has been published and accepted at CVPR 2020 earlier this year. With this work, we won the color challenge of, of last year on the track camera only, and we won this year on the track sensors only. To all knowledge, it's the first model-free reinforcement learning approach handling complex autonomous driving tasks, including pedestrian and vehicle on the roads, and particularly traffic lights. So for our reinforcement learning agent, we use a state, uh, an image of a single frontal camera. With this image, the agent must take an action, which is a pair of steering angle and throttle. This action is executed in Carla, and after this, the agent gets a reward and the next state. And the goal of the agent is to maximize the sum of the accumulated reward. So the context. We made this work for the color challenge of last year. The color challenge, in the color challenge, you must solve urban navigation tasks end to end. That means that you have only sensor as input. In our case, we used only one single frontal camera. And you must navigate in unseen environment. This includes pedestrian and vehicles and also traffic lights, which are both European traffic lights 
and US style traffic lights because the two types of traffic light are different. So the agent must define if it's European traffic lights, that means that the traffic light is on my side of the road. Of its US traffic light, the traffic light is on the other side of the road and much harder to detect when it's US style traffic light. So for our reinforcement learning setup, we used an algorithm which is a combination of three main algorithms in value-based reinforcement learning. First, we used Rainbow, which is actually the state of the art for on DRR on the Atari benchmark, coupled with IQN and APX. The second most important thing of a reinforcement learning setup is our reward function. So our reward function is made of two components. The first one is a desired speed illustrated there. So the reward of desired speed is maximum when the agent speed is at the desired speed. And what is really important is that this desired speed adapts to the situations. For example, by default, the desired speed, it has max speed. Then it goes to zero when the agent comes closer and closer to a red light. When the traffic light pass goes to green, the desired speed goes to max speed again. And the same behavior arise when the agent arrives behind an obstacle, like another vehicle, a pedestrian or bicycle. The second component of, of reward is a desired position. That means that there is both components, a lateral distance between the current agent position and the ideal position, and also a difference in the rotation between the current agent rotation and the ideal rotation of the road. We also use discretized action because we use value-based reinforcement learning and value-based reinforcement learning is well suited for discretized action. When we wanted to apply deep reinforcement learning to autonomous driving, we had one first major issue, which was the traffic light detection. Indeed, most DRL network, as the one used in DQN, for example, take 84 by 84 grayscale images as, as input. On these small images, the traffic light, and particularly, particularly the US traffic light, cannot be seen. So we had to use a much bigger image as input, and thus a much bigger network, which is much harder and slower to train, particularly knowing that the error training signal is much weaker than the standard supervised training signal. So in our case, we use the ResNet 18, and even so, the ResNet 18 is a small network regarding standard in supervised learning, it contains already more than 100 times more weight than previously network used in GRL paper, as the one used in DQN, for example. And finally, to handle different navigation commands, as going left at the next intersection or going right at the next intersection, we use multi-head branching. So that means that we have six heads, one for and each head is specific is used for each order. And also to ensure some temporality in the input, we concatenate four past RGB images as seen there. But when we when we wanted to train this big network with reinforcement learning, we had issue because it was taking way too much time and was really difficult to make it converge. So to actually make it work, we had to use a technique that we coined implicit affordances. So the idea is to first pre-train the ResNet encoder to predict affordances and perception tasks, such as predicting the semantic segmentation or predicting, predicting traffic light information, for example, the traffic light state. Then we use the bottleneck features of this encoder decoder. So we use the features there. And we use these features as the RL state. We name these features implicit affordances because we don't use the explicit prediction of our decoder network. We just use the features from which the decoder can predict the different affordances. And this has a main interest is that the RL training signal is only used to train the last part of the network. So the, only the fully connected are trained in the reinforcement learning training, in fact the ResNet is, keep, is kept frozen. And we found that the two most important tasks for this pre-training 
was the prediction of semantic segmentation and the prediction of the traffic light state. But if you just do this, even with the pre-training with the implicit abundances, it's still not working. And we need we had to use some other acts to actually make it work. So first, we had to use viewpoint augmentation even at the perception level. That means that, in fact, when we first recorded our data coming from the expert autopilot in Carla, we found that the expert was always in the middle of the lane. And for example, we can see on the segmentation that the lane are almost always at the same position on the images. But the encoder trained with this data was not generaliz generaliz generalizing well to the data encountered when the RL was driving. Because in fact, when the agent of reinforcement learning drives, it deviates from the lane center. And we can see that the segmentation, for example, is much different, much more different than the one seen in the training data. So we had to use viewpoint augmentation to simulate as if the expert of Carla was not exactly in the middle of the lane to add more varia variability in the training data of the encoder. Also, we had another issue with the discretations. In fact, if we, we had at the beginning trouble of oscillation, the agents were oscillating too much. So we had to use consecutive snapshots, so multiple prediction. So for example, we take five consecutive snapshots of the same training. We take the five prediction and we apply the mean of these five prediction. And this was giving way better, way better performances. And also, really important to note, it was giving a really little overhead of computation because, as we said, the most part of the network is frozen. All the encoder is frozen, just the fully connected are not frozen. So we just need to make five forward. If we use five snapshots, we just need to make five forward of the fully connected. But the encoder, we only need to make one forward. So that means that we don't lose any time, in fact, by doing so. Finally, we made some evaluation of the standard color benchmark, and we found that we were outperforming by a large margin the only previous error baseline. We demonstrate for the first time a reinforcement learning approach reaching results close or better than imitation approaches. In fact, all the, all the state-of-the-art methods are using imitation learning and not reinforcement learning. In fact, only the current state-of-the-art learning by cheating gives higher results than ours. But importantly to note, learning by cheating was competing with us this year at the CARA Challenge, and we had we finished at the first place with 25% of driving score, whereas learning by cheating was only at nine. So that means that our method is more suited for a more, a more complex task, like, like the task of the CARA Challenge. Finally, I, I want to show some quantitative result, some qualitative result with a video of the agent driving. So first, we will see. So uh, we will see on the upper top right. This is the only input of the agent. This is just an external view of the agent, just for visualization. And all the other parts in the image, like the semantic segmentation there, or all the information like the traffic light state are the affordances predicted by the agent. The only input to the agent is the image there. And we will see that with this, only this image, the agent will succeed to, for example, stop at pedestrian. For example, we see that there is a pedestrian crossing there and the agent stop. You can see that it predicts pedestrian and car in the semantic segmentation. And we will see that it can drive well in traffic jams, like by doing stop and go with the front vehicle, like when the front vehicle is moving, the agent move and stop when the front vehicle stops. And finally, we will see that the agent can even make emergency braking there. The traffic light goes to red and the agent stop instantly and will wait until the, agent, the traffic light passes to green, like there. OK, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed my talk.
Hi, I am Aditya Prakash from the Autonomous Vision Group at the University of Tübingen and the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. And I am going to present our work on incorporating attention in imitation learning. This work is done jointly with Kashyap Chitta and Andreas Geiger. Consider a scenario where the eco vehicle shown here in green is about to enter an intersection and there are vehicles coming in from the left shown here in red and traffic lights on the right shown in yellow. To safely navigate this intersection, the ego vehicle needs to capture the spatial and temporal context of the scene as well as model the interaction between different components such as vehicles and traffic lights. Towards this goal, we first tackle the question, can we incorporate spatial and temporal structure into intermediate representations for end-to-end -end driving? Our key idea is to use implicit functions to represent scene dynamics. Implicit functions have been shown to be quite effective in 3D vision to represent object and dynamics at arbitrary resolutions with a constant memory footprint. We also use bird's eye use semantic prediction as an auxiliary task along with waypoint prediction since bird's eye view space is a natural control space for representing vehicle dynamics. Moreover, bird's eye view semantic annotation is readily available in simulators such as Carla and has been shown to be effective for driving tasks by previous approaches such as learning by cheating. Our neural attention fields takes as input 2D image patch features. These patch features are extracted by 2D encoders such as ResNet and can be quite high dimensional due to multi-view image and multi-time step input. We, uh, we convert this into a compact representation C1 by taking mean over all the image features. This is equivalent to using a uniform attention map over all the patches as a prior. We then use NEAT, which is an, an MLP that continuously represents the attention map over the patches for any location XYT in the bird's eye view space. NEAT takes as input the aggregated features from the previous time step CI and the location XYT. The attention map is updated after every iteration to focus on the patches which are more relevant to the location XYT. After end iterations, we obtain CN, which is then used to predict the semantics and 2D offsets to the ground truth waypoint for any location XYT in the bird's eye view coordinate space. At test time, we use the offsets from the sample points to obtain a trajectory that is fed to a PID controller to output vehicle controls. Next, we, sh uh, come, we show some qualitative results of our neural attention fields and compare against the learning by cheating baseline. Need can predict continuous bird's eye view semantics from 2D images while performing the driving task. Specifically, we consider road obstacles red light and green light classes. Prior approaches such as learning by cheating also uses bird's eye view semantic supervision However, we observe that it is unable to cope with the challenging urban scenarios. LBC frequency frequently leads to traffic light violations and collisions resulting in dangerous situations. Now we compare our neat representation against learning by cheating.
we observe that NEAT is able to safely navigate these scenarios while leading to fewer collisions and traffic light violations. While NEAT outperforms LBC, it requires board side view semantic supervision, which can be quite expensive to obtain in real world. To overcome this limitation, additional modalities such as LiDAR can be used. This raises an important question. How to exploit complementary advantages of different modalities for end-to-end -end driving? Our key idea is to use attention-based transformers to incorporate global contextual reasoning by integrating representations from different modalities. From the illustration shown here, it is evident that image-only and LiDAR-only models are more likely to fail in these difficult intersection scenarios. By using both these modalities together, it is possible to capture the global context of the 3D scene. We consider RGB image and LiDAR BEV as input to our two-stream architecture. We then use transformers for dense feature fusion between the features extracted by the ResNet modules. This feature fusion is carried out at multiple resolutions throughout the feature extractor. The features extracted from the two modalities are unrolled into a 1D sequence and then provided as input to the self-attention module. This self-attention module is applied multiple times, which helps to capture higher order interactions between different components in the input modalities. Our overall architecture is shown here. Transducer outputs a 512 dimensional feature vector, which is downsampled using an MLP before passing it to our autoregressive waypoint prediction network modeled using GRUs. This uh, waypoint prediction network predicts the future waypoints for four time steps. Our entire architecture is trained end to end using L1 loss function between the predicted waypoints and the ground truth waypoint. We now show some qualitative results of our transfusion model and compare against baselines. Traditional methods in fusion literature use geometry-based feature projections for integrating representations. However, geometry fusion underperforms in complex urban scenarios. Now we compare our transfusion model against geometric fusion. We observe that our transfusion model is able to safely navigate these difficult scenarios with fewer infractions. Next, we describe our experimental setup and leaderboard results. We consider three cameras oriented at front, 60 degree left and 60 degree right, each with a field of view of 100 degrees. NEAT uses all the three cameras, whereas transfuser uses only the front camera. Transfuser also uses the additional LiDAR modality as input. Further, we use IMU for to get orientation, GPS for localization, and speedometer to get the current speed of the eco vehicle. For generating training data set, we use eight towns and 14 weather conditions. We use the leaderboard provided 76 routes and also include additional turnings and intersections. We use Carla scenarios 1, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and 10 in our training dataset. Our overall dataset size is 150,000 frames. 
On the leaderboard, both our models, NEAT and Transfuser, outperform learning by cheating. In addition, we also evaluate an ensemble of our models. For the ensemble, the steering value is provided by NEAT, whereas the brake is considered as the maximum of the two and throttle is taken as the minimum of the two. This results in a more conservative model resulting in fewer infractions. RL-based approaches such as Marlin have been shown to have orthogonal benefits to imitation learning approaches as ours. We believe that combining RL with imitation learning methods can lead to an even better performance. Thank you for listening to our talk. If you are interested in our work, feel free to reach out to us. We are happy to take any questions. Hi, I'm Brady, and today I'm presenting our Learning by Cheating baseline uh, for the 2020 Carla Challenge. In our approach, we train a sensory motor agent that drives using raw RGB images as input. And to do this, we split the training into two stages. First, we train a privileged agent that drives using the internal uh, state of the simulator. And because this agent drives on this ground truth state, it's essentially cheating. Right. The, the agent bypasses perception completely and only needs to learn how to plan. In the second stage, we train the sensory motor agent. And this agent no longer has access to privilege information and drives using raw pixels as input. The sensory motor agent is trained via distillation um, using the privilege agent and supervision. So such a decomposition yields three key advantages. First, the simulator state can be condensed into a very rich representation for the downstream task. Uh, this allows the privilege agent uh, to generalize better. In turn, a better teacher allows the sensory motor agent to train under much stronger supervision. And finally, the, the privilege agent acts as a real-time oracle and allows us to perform on-policy training methods that assume access to an expert policy. So here is the um, our pipeline for the challenge. Uh, it, it can be split up into three stages, um, data collection, training, and uh, evaluation and validation. So first, we collected a data set and we collected demonstrations on 50 routes spanning several towns. As you can see, uh, we randomized the weather and time of day every couple of seconds to uh, increase the diversity seen across the demonstrations. For each time step, we use the internal simulator state to generate privileged information in the form of a bird's eye view. Along with this, we save the corresponding ego vehicle's first person view, as well as camera pose and a high level command, which we represent as a far away desired future waypoint. We collect 50,000 of these samples for our baseline, um, which equates to less than 10 hours of uh, driving experience. Next in our pipeline, we train the privileged agent. We represent the privilege agent with a deep network. And this agent operates on two inputs, the bird's eye view, uh, which gives information about the current state, and the high level command, which tells you where you should get, where you want to go, at least the general direction. And we encode the high level command into a 2D heat map. The pri uh, privilege agent is trained to predict the future trajectory of the ego vehicle and is supervised from the ground truth trajectory from the actual demonstration. The trajectory spans two and a half seconds, and it is represented simply by five waypoints. So one thing that we do during training is that we augment the data set for the privilege agent by employing small rotations and shifts uh, on the bird's eye view and corresponding trajectory. 
This allows the agent to learn how to act even under local perturbations for no additional cost. And with these augmentations, the agent can learn what to do in particularly difficult scenarios. Like uh, for instance, on the right, we can learn how to recover from driving into the oncoming lane, and we can do this without ever actually being in this exact scenario. With the privilege agent trained, we can move on to the next step of distillation of the privilege agent into the sensory motor agent. In terms of architecture, the privilege agent and the sensory motor agent are nearly identical. And the only difference is that the sensory motor agent now acts on raw RGB images. For a single training step, we'll need the privilege agent and require only a bird's eye view and first person view uh, pairs. So one neat thing about having access to a, a live expert is that we can actually query arbitrary high-level commands and supervise the sensory motor agent with the trajectories that were predicted from the privilege agent. So having access to this agent, uh, this privilege agent, allows us to ask what-if scenarios and provides labels for multiple future trajectories, uh, not just the ones seen during demonstration. For example, uh, instead of taking a left here, we can provide labels for what if the vehicle was supposed to go straight? And we can do this just by querying the privilege agent. So this turns out to be a much stronger supervisory signal, and it is, um, and we found it to be essential in training an effective uh, sensory motor agent. So finally, at test time, we use the trained sensory motor agent to plan a trajectory given a raw RGB image and um, we turn this trajectory into low-level controls uh, via a PID controller. Our approach to the challenge requires only a static data set and is trained in a fully offline manner. Uh, and training of uh, both of these stages takes less than two days on a single GPU machine. During test time, the sensory motor agent only requires access to GPS sensors, a speedometer, and um, dashboard cameras. And since this agent uh, is essentially just a, a forward pass through a network, this agent can easily run in real time. So here we have some quantitative results. And these are pulled from the official leaderboard. And on the right, you'll see a video of our a sensory motor agent driving in an unseen highway route. Okay. And in this video, um, the third person view is for visualization purposes only. And the actual view that the agent uses to drive uh, can be seen in the top right. So here it, uh, it took a right because the high level command was a slight right instead of slight left. And then you can see that it's uh, following the lane. So here are some of the major failure modes we observed during validation. And one of them was uh, failure to follow high-level command, where uh, the, the high-level command would be to do a slight left, and the ego vehicle would just want to keep continuing. And then in turn, later down the route, the ego vehicle would miss uh, like a left exit or a hard left turn. Another problem that we saw was in the low-level controller, which turns the predicted trajectory into low-level actions. And even if the sensory motor agent had predicted a, a, a very reasonable trajectory, uh, sometimes the controller would fail to actually get the ego vehicle to those positions. Uh, and finally, our model uses a single frame to act on and thus has no temporal uh, understanding of the world. And uh, there's, there's no chance that it can do anything that requires temporal reasoning uh, in, in a safe manner, right? So. 
if you drove this car to a stop sign, um, you either pray it will stop completely or just blast through it. So for additional implementation details, hyperparameters, whatever, you can find code. Uh, we have a copy of our data and pre-trained models in the following GitHub URL. Uh, and you can also check out the link to our Coral 19 paper if you want more uh, technical details. Finally, we'd like to say a big thank you to the Carla team and the other contributors who put in the massive amounts of work uh, into hosting this challenge. And with that, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any additional questions. And thank you for watching.